it's time to bring on our next guest. Yes. And I'm super excited to um, have uh, Dr. Norton and Dr. Testori uh, to talk a, talk a lot about really what has been on our minds mm-hmm. uh, since I talked to, and I'll, I'll tell my little story about insertional torque value. And I was placed in an implant that Dr. Norton knows so well uh, back over 10 years ago. And I was at Lyndon Cooper, a very special event that a uh, company put on at UNC. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, so I've read a lot of your studies on bone and, and how it works. And, and I said, I, I trust the, the implant and I trust the technology behind it. But what I can't get past my mechanical mind, my dad's an engineer, is the fact that you say that a low insertional torque value here, as long as you can't, he, he said this, he's like, Wes, he said, as long as you can't spin it in, your, in the bone, in your hand, then trust it. Hmm. And I was like, and you're second staging? So here we are 10 years ago where I'm burying everything. Like, I mean, let's put it all to sleep, right? And I go to, if it doesn't spin, if it doesn't spin, put a healing abutment on it, John. Right. And I remember you telling you this, and you said you're a cowboy. Right, I, I did. said, but Doc, what? I did call you the a cowboy. The research. You called me a cowboy. I did. Right? I did. And, and, it, and because it challenged my thought process. So here we have, you know, Dr. Norton, Dr. Testori, both widely published in the areas of both insertional torque value. We've obviously talked a lot about that through textbooks, through articles, and also um, ISQ and resonance frequency analysis. These are both areas that you guys are both quite familiar with. And we would just love to have the discussion of, you know, how much do these things matter? How much does torque matter? And how much should we rely upon it? How much does ISQ matter? And how much should we rely upon it? Uh, how much, how tight is too tight? How, how loose is too loose? These are topics that both of you are, of course, very well versed. And we'll start with you, Dr. Norton. Talk, talk a little bit about today, your thoughts on these, on, on these issues. So thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's, it's great to join you guys. And let me start by saying I was being very kind to you because I told you, according to you at least, that uh, we stop at spinners. We absolutely don't stop at spinners. Spinners are our friends. We put a healing abutment this on them. This is what I was waiting for. It's absolutely no issue. Yes. And in fact, the way you introduce that topic just it's like reeling in the bait. I mean, <laughs> y- you know, you said your dad was an engineer. Is yes, that what you said? that's right. Yeah, well, I got news for you. We're not carpenters and we're not engineers. We're biologists. Yes. We're, we are surgeons treating a living vital tissue. We're not working on bone, mm-hmm. uh, on wood, mm-hmm. I should say. And there is a fundamental difference. I mean, let's put, let, let's keep the metaphor going. Okay, so... You have a picture or a painting. Human beings are actually really good. You pick up, in terms of visualizing, the concept of primary stability. How do I mean? So you pick up a painting or a picture that you want to hang on your wall. You immediately get an impression in your mind of how heavy that painting is. And that impression in of itself gives you an understanding of how big the screw or the nail or whatever you're hanging it up with, right? How big it should be, how deep it should be. And when you drill into the, the wall, right, is, it, is it brick, is it breeze block, is it drywall? Your brain immediately calculates the bone density of that wall, if you'll uh, mm-hmm, run mm-hmm. with it. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm, yeah. And somehow or other, you make a qualitative assessment of how big the screw should be, how deep the screw should go into that wall in order to hang that picture. Mm -hmm. Because, sure, you don't want to come down the next morning and find the picture on the floor shattered into pieces, right? The problem is that that substrate is an inanimate substrate. It has no potential to change the way in which it interfaces with the screw. So you go back 10 years later, you hate the picture, right? You hate the frigging picture. Mm. You want to take it off, but now you've got a screw in the wall. So you want to take the screw out and patch it up or whatever you want to do. Thing is, you can take the screw out. There's been no change in the relationship between the screw and the wall, the screw and the substrate. That is not a dental implant and and bone is not an inanimate substrate. Mm -hmm. 
So now if we bring it into the biological realm, you take that same innate understanding, and it's an amazing innate understanding, but you apply that to a living vital tissue like bone, and what you actually do is you damage that bone, okay? The desire for getting this massive insertion torque so that it's really tight so that you can go home and feel good about the fact that your immediate load provisional or whatever isn't going to fall out that night. That's fine at that level. But what you don't see is what's happening at the cellular level. Mm. The damage you've done to that bone through super compression, right? The potential start of a pressure necrosis curve, which may not translate all the way through to actual pressure necrosis, but the literature is abundant with evidence that you damage that bone. Now, I'm not saying, and I have never said, that that translates to higher failure of implants, because it probably doesn't. But what it absolutely does is translate to a poorer quality of his osseointegration that takes longer to achieve because of the damage you've applied to the bone. Mm. Well, I don't want that. I want quicker osseointegration, and I want a better quality of osseointegration. And the way you do that is to respect the bone, to get enough primary stability, however we measure that, which we're going to talk about mm -hmm. this evening, to get enough primary stability to do the job, but without insulting the bone. Mm. And that's always been my position. And yeah. it's still my position. Yeah, Dr. Sestori, respond to that. How do you feel about that and the, the pressure necrosis curve? And this uh, is it just a matter of uh, putting it in to, to feel good about yourself uh, at the end of that procedure? No, I, I think he made the point that the last word, you should not do any damage to the bone at first. But pressure necrosis, and we wrote uh, a white paper with Alan Meltzer many years ago, Myth or reality, we think that it's a myth. So to be very practical, first of all, should I do an immediate low case or should I do a delayed case? If I should I do an immediate case, single tooth restoration, I get to have that implant that is stable. And the implant should not scream in the bone, but the implant should have 50... 40 to 50 deg uh, newton centimeters of primary stability and we rely upon uh, insertion torque, uh, incremental insertion torque, so the curves should be incremental. We don't like to have a flat curve and all of a sudden a peak torque. To be very practical, we never teach to under-prepare the cortical because it's imp if you under-prepare the cortical, the, the implant cannot go flush with the bone, so it's, it's a matter. And on top of that, uh, it's a post-extraction case, it's not a post-extraction case. And then we learn over the year how to respect the bone, not doing any damage mainly to the cortical. But the implant should be stable in medullary bone. That's, uh, that's our, our position. And on top of that, uh, we speak about torque. But which device you have, which drilling machine, because clinicians take a lot of attention on the implant, the hardware, but not on the drilling machine. You got to have a reliable drilling machine that gives you the readings because otherwise and then another big issue opens is the handpiece well lubricated mm. it's old it's not old which kind of burrs are you using are you doing guided so there are multiple factors that can mislead the, the clinician in the torque value readings and on top of that, you should always give a limit to the doctors in order to understand that which is the average torque that you need to have. For single tooth application, in the range of 40 to 50, even if there are papers in the literature, if you take the Kayat kind of paper, 
is showing you with the no belly implants with the real torque device that can measure the torque implants that goes in 172 newtons but then you should ask yourself ask the company the implant system that you use at which torque you have a deformation of internal x or the external x because otherwise that implant will not be used for a single tooth application and then you should really understand the biology behind that in the next issue of Jomi, we published 39 very atrophic mandibles that means uh, six seven millimeters white bone like this desk so very dense 20 newtons uh, and immediate loading because in very dense bone you cannot have micro movement and we did immediate loading and the referees gave us hard times uh, and they said how comes that you have uh, clinical success but you have only 20 newtons and you immediately load is too low no you don't know biology my dear referee because the the bone is white like this. We are in the interforaminal mandible. So you, you have to control the micro movement and the insertion torque and the primary stability in very dense bone is not that important. In dense bone can be detrimental, not to the bone, but fracturing the mandible. And we present in one case in which we, at the university, the guy was placing the implant, not following the protocol, and screwing the implant because of immediate loading, not following my guidelines, and we have an initial fracture of the mandible by torquing the implant. So primary stability and bone quality, they got to be in, in, in some way very well known by clinicians. And on top of that, uh, the shape, the macro geometry of the implant. Every kind of implant has a kind of a specific indication. It depends on the, we do a lot of post extraction cases. And that, in order to have in the aperture a better primary stability, the macro geometry plays a role. Because if you don't have enough bone in the apex of the two, can I still do immediate loading? Yes, you can, but you got to have the right shape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I perfectly agree that biology is very important, but on top of that, we should take into consideration which kind of uh, drilling machine, the armamentarium that we are using. We get to know that. And on top of that, all the other factors. Hmm. Yeah, you know, the market has definitely followed uh, what Dr. Testori has, is saying, is that, you know, we're going to change the design of our <laughs> implant to make us maybe feel better or follow along the lines of these V threads in that medullary bone, uh, these compressive threads in that upper middle third, and then less pressure on the cortex because, you know, well, we know what happens there. And, and then also I think about resonance frequency analysis and the fact that research has really shown that it is the only way to truly track bone to implant contact which in a smooth or a maybe an older school design implant where we had lower insertional torque values, we had maybe more BIC, right? And we achieved similar outcomes um, as and maybe better outcomes than high insertional yes, torque values. Speak to that, Dr. Norton, because I know you've published several, several articles. I remember going back years ago to an editorial in Jomi where you, you, you talked about yeah. viable constraint. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that got us thinking as you actually <laughs> had a, an equation. It was a beautiful thing to see an equation. <laughs> we like equations here at the Academy. We can quantify something. Yes. And, and, but that got us thinking a lot about you know, how, how much we should push this, this idea yeah. of torque. But as a counterpoint to that, uh, or maybe, it, maybe to add to that, where does the ISQ fall in a way of comparing these two approaches? Because it seems that that, that may be a way to differentiate. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, first of all, let me say I have a huge respect for my uh, opposition camp. 
okay? Um, <laughs> we knew and, that. <laughs> and uh, I think it's important for your listeners to understand yes. that this is educated debate. This isn't... Uh, this is this true is, science, this though, is right? true yeah. science, and it's not a duel. That's yeah. right. Okay, it's a search for the truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first thing I want to say is it's very interesting to me. I am a clinician, first and foremost. I'm not a bone biologist, Uh I'd like to think a part of being a clinician is being a biologist, but I'm a clinician first and foremost. And yet the interesting thing is, actually, if you distill the literature in terms of all of the articles written about particularly the influence of high insertion talk on what you affectionately call BIC, which for those who don't know stands for bone implant contact. Um, and those who are proponents of high talk, like Alan Meltzer particularly, it, what you see is that it's actually the bone biologists, the pure uh, bone biologists, the guys who are in the fundamentals like John Brunsky and Jill Helms and Lyndon Cooper. These are the sort of people who are looking at the way a bone cell reacts, at the way things happen at the biological level. Whereas the people who are publishing, like Philippe Kayat, who I know extremely well, and Alan Meltzer, and, and, and others, who are proponents of high insertion talk, are pure clinicians, right? Mm. And I think that goes to tell you something. Yes. Okay? What I've tried to do from my editorial, Mm -hmm. which you so kindly brought up, (laughs) uh, 2013, uh, and I was very grateful to Steve Eckert for allowing me to publish that because that really was the firing gun for this debate. Um, What I was trying to do was to try and see if we could start to achieve a middle ground Mm -hmm. Uh, between these two uh, camps. And, uh, you know, I I think bone-to-implant contact, and I I refer to that as just quality of osseointegration. There is a huge difference between talking about quality of osseointegration and implant success. Mm. An implant can be very successful in terms of does it drop out or does it stay in? and the quality of the bone implant contact. Uh, Actually, um, an Italian colleague of yours, Paolo Trizi, published a fascinating study, one of the first studies in the sheep model, you may remember, looking at high versus low insertion talk. And what was interesting in that study, and he saw his own results in a very different way to the way I saw them, But in his high insertion talk studies, he got a lot of microfractures of the bone. And in the low insertion talk study, he actually had a gap between the bone and the implant surface. And so the way he presented that was uh, uh, basically to say that in the high insertion talk group, they had a a high bone to implant contact. And in the low insertion talk group, they had virtually zero bone to implant contact, but only because they'd overprepared the osteotomy. Mm-hmm. But when you looked at the six week or four or six week follow up, I don't remember what it six was, weeks. there was a mass resorptive process around the high insertion talk implants. And there was actually a de novo bone deposition filling in the gap in the low insertion talk group. So this is the way that biology responds to pressure. Now, Tiziano, you said yourself, you know, in that marble bone, that quality one bone, you only had 20 newton centimeters. And it was interesting to hear what you said about the editor's reaction. One of the articles that I've, and I'm going to embarrass myself now because I'm getting senior in age and I'm starting to forget things. It's an article that I've referenced a million times. And for the life of me right now, I can't remember the name of the author. Uh, But in this 2006, I think it was, article, the authors were doing uh, atrophic, edentulous mandible, immediate load cases. Mm -hmm. And the most amazing statement in the discussion section of that article... Uh, and I'll have to send you the reference (laughs) because I just... It's not coming to me. But if it does, I'll tell you. They actually identify or point out that they had a minimum target insertion torque of, 
I forget what that was as well, 40 Newton centimeters, let's say. And something like 75% of all the implants failed to achieve the requisite insertion torque. Mm. Most of them, something like 60% of them were under 25 Newton centimeters, mm. but they got a 98% success rate. And in the discussion section, they themselves questioned how was it possible that they got that degree of success with such an inadequate insertion talk? Mm. How is it possible that Tiziano has done what he's done in this marble bone at 20 Newton centimeters? So that brings us very nicely into the discussion on ISQ. Because if you take the marble bone, that quality one dense bone scenario, let us imagine, if you will, that you prepare the osteotomy to full diameter. You then use a bone tap, let us say. Sure. Right? And, and cylinder mm. implants. And cylindrical implants. So now you have an implant that has pretty much no compressive friction, mm -hmm. rotational friction or compressive friction against the osteotomy. Because the osteotomy is now basically not only the same diameter, but it's been th pre-threaded. It's machined. It's yeah. machined. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. So the question I have for you is, how can that have any primary stability? Well, the answer is because the biggest misnomer in implant dentistry is that primary stability is measured by rotational friction. Mm. Mm. That makes no sense. Right. Primary stability is measured by axial stiffness. Here we go. And if you have a perfect fit between an implant and an osteotomy in dense bone, where there is basically no compressive friction at all, you still have a very high axial stiffness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now you have the perfect combination of high axial stiffness, zero compression on the bone, so you haven't destroyed the bone cells. They're happy, happy days. They're gonna produce new bone, and they're going to osseointegrate faster with a higher BIC, as you call it, in a shorter time. And that's what we look to achieve. Mm. 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 So <laughs> I think so in saying that, where where is the where do we see the problem with that line of, of reasoning? Is is it do you, you, you mentioned that you feel that the pressure necrosis is, is a myth or that you feel that it is not as important. It's a myth within the, <clears throat> the boundaries. We get to give numbers to the clinician because high insertion torque, we should give them guidelines and they should stay within the boundaries of those. I mean, high insertion torque, if you speak about 70, 80, it doesn't mean anything because you don't need them. It can be detrimental. Detrimental to the geometry, inner geometry of the implant <coughs> can be detrimental to the bone. So the guidelines for the guys that are in the field working on patient every day, do not underprepare the cortical layer you got to have congruency with the cortical layer. you got to pick up the right implant shape according to the bone. In our data set of mandibles, 39 mandibles, is not a big data set, but we have uh, almost uh, 200 implants, very old patient, cylindrical implants, and the fret pitch 0.6, pre-tapping, no important primary stability to 20 newtons and one point that I already said it's very important for us to understand that we got to have a reliable tool at the beginning to be very frank I was involved with the hostel with the mm -hmm. resonance frequency analysis then over the years we forgot to use that Let, let's it faded away because I am surgeon and I'm placing the implants and I do not see the need now for resonance frequency because I have 41 years of practice. My first implant was placed in 86. But I think for the less experienced doctors, I think resonance frequencies analysis is very important to understand 
and then for secondary stability, I do think it is the only way we have to monitor the implant. So from my perspective is very important resonance analysis frequency. If you have referrals to check for litigation and even to prove that the, you have OSI integration to monitor the implants down the road. And maybe for guys that they have a lot of practice, a lot of uh, experience, might not be so relevant uh, at uh, implant placement. This is my idea, but it's something that no doubt there's a scientific base behind that, a mm -hmm. lot of literature. Mm -hmm. And every young doctor should study that and get involved with resonance frequency. Well, so yeah, I, you've got to, you've I got, got to, to come I back. I saw you that. shaking your head <laughs> yeah. there. We've got just a few minutes here. Okay. okay. So, so first of all, the first thing to say is people don't have to believe in pressure necrosis or not believe it. Go on to Google, type in dental implant pressure necrosis, look at the stack of images that come up. They're all aggressive thread implants. All of the pressure necrosis is not in the cortex. It's in the cancellous compartment. This is, this is real. I see it regularly from patients that are referred to the practice. What really gets me angry is that the accusation is that these implants have failed from peri-implantitis. Mm. This is not peri-implantitis. This is unacceptable carpentry uh, masquerading as surgery. Hmm. Set that aside for a second. Let's just talk about ISQ. I have 32 years of experience placing implants. I, like Tiziana, I've placed thousands of implants. I think I understand and know what represents good implant placement. I have lots of patients that I still see who I treated 20, 25 coming up 30 years ago. So I understand it. So why the hell would I bother with ISQ? Right. I'll tell you why. And, and this is the mistake I think, and, and I met with the guys today from Ostel, and uh, you could level it at the whole, if you like, marketing of, of that concept. ISQ should not be sold as anything more than a two measure instrument. Mm. Torque is a one-measure instrument. You can't go back and re-measure the torque and get any appreciation for any change in the interaction between the bone and the implant. I don't care how experienced I am. I get, f I, you know, my, my personal success rate in practice is audited every single year, year in, year out, has been for the last 30 years. My success rate is somewhere in the region of 98 to 99 percent okay so i have every single year one to two percent failure rate so you could say well why bother with isq for that answer because i want to eradicate the one to two percent because i don't want any patient to be that one to two percent because for that patient it's a hundred percent well i restore a lot of the implants i place and one of the beautiful things about ISQ, whether you believe it predicts failure or not, it's irrelevant. It's a red herring. What predicts, and it's not a prediction, it's an actual, is when you see an implant placement, you had a primary stability as measured by ISQ of, say, 78. Three months later, you come to take the healing abutment off and take the, the impression mm -hmm. for definitive restoration, and suddenly the ISQ is 65. Oh You've got to ask yourself a question, right? Yeah. right? right. You've got to take an x-ray, you maybe take a scan, because maybe you don't even see it on a two-dimensional right. x-ray, but you have to ask yourself questions, and you have to delay the restoration of that implant. That's why I do ISQ, because nothing else in the industry gives us the opportunity of comparative assessment of the bone implant interface and nothing else is currently available that gives us the opportunity to at least try to eradicate that one to two percent failure. Mm. Talk can't do that for you. Right. Now I will say just to kind of come back to the oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Of one thing 
I am a medical doctor and it's important not to rely only on one factor in medicine. You have to rely on multiple factors. And we learn over the years how to fool the instrument. If you have an implant, you have a cortical layer, no bone there, very little density of that bone, and you hammer the implant and you take an ISQ, you, have, you can have very high readings. But that implant is locked only in this cortical layer. Yeah, but that's only one reading, Tiziana. You have to retake that reading some months later, and then you're yes, comparing like with I'm, like. Yes, I'm, te I'm telling you at first stage surgery. Mm. I'm not saying that it's useless, but I'm saying that you got to have multiple factors 100% to, agree. to analyze, and then you get to know biology, even and you got to understand how the tool works mm -hmm. because 100%. otherwise if the guys the young guys only eat at least one readings and then and on top of that if you are in the let's say poor quality bone and you got to screw the impl the, the 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 post the on top of the you can lose a little bit of primary stability. I've seen that they can move. So there are multiple factors to analyze. Yeah. There's no question. If you only use ISQ as a one reading instrument, it's no more valuable than using talk sure. as a one instrument reading. Well, it's useless. And how how instrument. important, conversely, then mm -hmm. I will say, you mentioned you know spinners are our friends, right? So if you're going for an immediate loading situation, right? what are you shooting for? Is insertional, is ITV something that you say, well, I, I would like to have a certain number. Does it matter more when we're immediately loading uh, than if we are planning on doing a two-stage situation? So in my 2017 article where I use ISQ to look at, uh, could we identify a threshold of insertion talk where axial stiffness actually becomes more predictable? Mm -hmm. I've always in my lectures said 25 newton centimeters, 20 to 25 newton centimeters is the minimum threshold. I probably still stick by that, but actually I disproved that because in my 2017 article, what I actually showed is that the variability of ISQ values was very wide for all implants placed under 10 newton centimeters. Mm. But when you got above 10 newton centimeters, the variability in ISQ was almost nothing. Mm. I mean, the, the distribution around the mean was minuscule. And so actually what I demonstrated in that study is that anything over 10 newton centimeters actually has a predictable stiffness. So if you have an insertion torque above 10 newton centimeters, which let's face it, most people do, Okay, whatever your ISQ value is, it's probably pretty accurate. You could take it a hundred times, it would be that value. Mm -hmm. So if that value is under 65, you have an unstable implant. You should not immediately load it. But if you have a value of 68, 70, 75, and let's be clear, you can have an ISQ value of 75 with an implant that has an insertion torque of 10 newton centimeters. Mm -hmm. I have no compunction loading that implant immediately. Mm. Well, mm. there you have it. We're going to be 40 to 50, right? Yeah. And we're going to have an insertion torque of 10, but we're going to have to read an ISQ of at least 65 plus, mm -hmm. right? And so I hate to even shut this down <laughs> because here's the, here's the thing is that for years I've read these articles. Oh, yeah. I'm teaching this. My first slide in the recent lecture that I taught, you saw it. Yeah. It has a mechanic on one side split right down the PowerPoint slide and it has a biologist on the other side. Mm. And it has this, this little circle spinning with arrows, right? And it's teaching dentists to not just be a mechanic, mm -hmm. to be my dad's engineer, but to be a biologist, to be a doctor, like you said. And one of the things about doctors is we do like to have two things that confirm a diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? And I know that with recent things and even my own family, mm -hmm. learning about diagnosis and diseases sure. and how we do things. And I think as we become better doctors, 
will become better mechanics. Yep. And for biology that's dynamic and not static. I really want to thank Dr. Norton, Dr. Testori for coming on. They both are friends. And this is what we wanted, John, is yep. a, is, this is what science is all about. And you know what? This is what the AO is all about. The AO about, is all about bringing you next level content that you can really come to a place where you can learn what great clinicians and researchers are doing. And mm-hmm. so... And join in the debate because it, right. it is a spirited debate. And again, it's a search for truth, as you said. It's, mm-hmm. and, uh, it's that's, science. That's it's what science. science is all about.